Welcome, everyone. My name is Federico Morelega Golcher, and I will be the moderator today for the uh, series on medical education by Nova Biomedical. Today, we will be uh, addressing, treating, and monitoring SIRS and sepsis small animals. Our presenter will be Dr. Deborah Silverstein. She is an associate professor at the Department of Clinical Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania the School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Silverstein currently is an associate professor of critical care at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her DVM from the University of Georgia, where she also completed a rotating small animal internship before her residency in animal emergency and critical care at the University of California in Davis. Her research interests include the diagnosis and treatment of various shock states, including sepsis, and changes in the microcirculation of critically ill patients. She co-edited a textbook, Small Animal Critical Care Medicine, and just finished serving as a vice president and scientific chair for the American College of Veterinary Medicine. We have approved for race continuing education credits this webinar, and after it, you will receive an email with a program survey link. After completing the survey, follow the link to download your continuous education certificate. There will be a question and answer session after the webinar. Please type questions in the Q&A box located in your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Frederico, for the kind introduction. And welcome back to all of those who joined for part one uh, for the recognition and diagnosis of SIRS and sepsis in small animals. We are now going to move on to part two, which is again red hot and inflamed, this time focusing on the treatment and monitoring of SIRS and sepsis in small animals. I'd like to once again thank NOVA for kindly inviting me to do these CE opportunities, and, and I hope you get a lot of good information out of the next hour. So we talked about last time the fact that a very timely recognition of SIRS and sepsis as well as rapid diagnostics are of utmost importance in trying to quickly treat and maximize success in animals suffering from this disease process. And although there really are no magic bullets for these animals, we do know that aggressive empiric therapy as well as supportive care are the key to success with these patients. So the next hour, just a brief overview, we'll start by talking a little bit about trying to prevent MODs by maximizing oxygen delivery to the tissues, the importance of goal-directed therapy in a timely manner, and then more specifically, the various treatment recommendations, as well as monitoring parameters that we currently know to be useful in these patients based on the evidence available. And then finally, we'll finish up with a case presentation to go through a bit of what we've talked about over the last part of the webinar in part one, as well as what we've talked about tonight. So moving on to uh, the first slide, the management of SIRS or sepsis. Just again, a little bit of a general overview of what we want to accomplish in these patients. One is we really need to normalize oxygen delivery to the tissues. We don't necessarily need to make the oxygen delivery above normal, but we do want it to be as close to normal as possible. In addition, we want to provide hemodynamic support to maximize intravascular volume as well as pressure in order to keep oxygen circulating to the tissues. We want to provide vasopressor and or inotropic support when necessary 
We also want to administer oxygen therapy to animals who may benefit, treat any infection that is suspected or present based on our diagnostics, provide timely nutrition, Monitor these animals very closely, generally 24 hours a day uh, is ideal, and if that's not available, then referral to a 24-hour or overnight practice is advisable. And then lastly, we want to prevent multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. We briefly touched upon MODS in the last lecture, but I wanted to view one more time the study that we looked at, which is the association between outcome and organ system dysfunction in dogs with sepsis, looking at 114 cases. And this study actually was a multi-institutional study that included seven universities or private practices and included uh, animals that had sepsis as a diagnosis. And we took dogs specifically with septic peritonitis as a, a fairly standardized disease process. And we categorize the organ dysfunction as either acute kidney injury, defined as a creatinine greater than 0.5 milligrams per deciliter, cardiovascular dysfunction, defined as the need for vasopressor therapy, respiratory dysfunction, dysfunction is defined as the need for oxygen therapy or mechanical ventilation, and hepatic dysfunction was defined as a bilirubin greater than 0.5, and coagulation dysfunction, a prolonged PT, PTT, or platelets that were less than 100,000 per microliter. And what we found in this study, so what we found in this study is that 89 septic dogs had at least one organ that was dysfunctional, and 57 or 50 percent of the dogs actually had MODS, which you may recall is defined as two or more organs that are dysfunctional. The mortality rate increased as the number of dysfunctional organ systems increased, as we might predict, with the mortality rate at 70% in dogs with MODS compared to only 25% in dogs that did not have multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. The overall mortality for sepsis in small animal medicine has historically been anywhere from about 20 to 68%. Uh, there's one more recent study in dogs with pyometra that was in the lower range at 36.7%, um, with 91% of the dogs dying in that study had septic shock. And then in 2013 and 2015, two additional studies finding anywhere from 30 to 43% mortality. Uh, so it depends a little on the study, the, the stage of the animals that are being studied. But the mortality rate is high with this disease in veterinary medicine. So, so the initial management of patients with possible sepsis or SIRS is going to first include just a rapid assessment and stabilization of the patient as soon as possible. We want to treat any cardiovascular shock if present most commonly due to either hypovolemic shock or potentially distributive shock, which is inappropriate vasodilation secondary to cytokines. We want to obtain any diagnostic samples that we may need for culture and susceptibility testing or other types of infectious testing, and go ahead and start empiric antimicrobial therapy as soon as possible if we do suspect an infectious process. We want to maximize oxygen delivery to the tissues, as we mentioned in the beginning, because every hour of delay in increasing oxygen delivery is going to mean increases in mortality due to organ dysfunction from ischemia and hypoperfusion. So let's look more specifically at what we can do to maximize oxygen delivery to the tissues. This is an algorithm that I really like that breaks down oxygen delivery in an easy to understand way. If you look on the right side, you can see that cardiac output is 50% is of oxygen delivery in this model with heart rate and stroke volume making up cardiac output. And then stroke volume is comprised of preload, afterload, and contractility. And when we give intravenous fluid therapy, we're really working on the preload to increase stroke volume, increase cardiac output, and increase oxygen delivery. On the other side, on the left side of this picture, you see blood oxygen content, which is the combination of 
hemoglobin concentration, the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin, and the partial pressure of oxygen in the microcirculatory blood. So we want to make sure that all of these parameters are maximized in order to normalize oxygen delivery to the, to the tissues. So our general treatment goals, and this is going to serve as the basis for a lot of what we speak about in the upcoming slides. Well, we want to start with blood pressure, easy to measure, either oscillometric or Doppler, and we want to keep the mean arterial pressure greater than 65 or the Doppler greater than 90 millimeters of mercury. We want to try and keep the packed cell volume at least 24, if, if not higher, with acute anemia. And we want the PaO2 to be between 80 millimeters of mercury and 120 millimeters of mercury, which equates to a pulse oximetry reading of 95% or greater. We want the heart rate to be within normal limits. We want the temperature to be as close to normal as possible. The central venous oxygen saturation of at least 65 to 70 percent, and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. And lastly, we want to try and uh, get the lactate less than two millimoles per liter if at all possible. So the next question is, you know, how quickly does this need to be done? These are some pretty hefty goals we have. And should we use protocols to try and achieve this? Is it just common knowledge? Um, let's look a little bit at, at literature. This top article that you see is, is an oldie but goodie by Dr. Rivers in 2001, which really popularized the notion of using early goal-directed therapy to treat sepsis. And uh, this study showed that the use of uh, rapid stabilization techniques and aggressive monitoring to stabilize these patients in a shorter period of time than was traditionally done actually did seem to make a difference in terms of mortality um, and length of hospitalization. Subsequent studies, however, the next three that you see on this uh, slide did not find similar results. And you also see that these studies are in the last few years um, they're very well-known studies because they looked at goal-directed therapy for the treatment of septic shock and have not found any difference with standard of care. So this is in contrast to the first study in 2001. And what we've subsequently determined is that our standard of care has actually improved since 2001. And therefore, the traditional therapy that we commonly use compared to these protocols actually are pretty similar. And so a lot of these studies use good quality goal-directed therapy, even for the group that was not being studied. In addition, we probably have now learned that using advanced monitoring like central venous oxygen saturation or strict transfusion or vasopressor guidelines are not necessary to improve outcome and can be associated with more cost. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So the idea of using bundle therapy is quite common in people and has actually been studied um, a little bit in veterinary medicine, which we'll talk about. But the human guidelines for bundle approach means what, what are you going to do to try and uh, meet your goals and in what time frame? And these are the current guidelines based on the 2016 Surviving Sepsis Guidelines that say if organ dysfunction is present, then you want to use a three-hour bundle approach to treatment. If infection, hypotension, and the lactate is greater than four, then give a 30 mil per kilo isotonic crystalloid bolus, reassess volume responsiveness and tissue perfusion afterward. And then the six hour bundle is to repeat all measurements in lactate if the initial lactate was greater than two. But the new definitions that we talked about in part one of this series do not change the need for early sepsis identification and the initiation of therapy. So rather, we want to use our basic resuscitation and diagnostics as well as empiric therapy to try and get oxygen delivery as, as normalized as possible, as quickly as possible. So let's start with hemodynamic support. There's a lot of choices out there for what fluids to give. We have isotonic crystalloids, hypertonic crystalloids, synthetic colloids a combination of these three products or potentially the use of blood products. 
Um, and we're not going to focus as much on blood products in, in this lecture just because of the time constraints. But what I do want to mention is that although we have a lot of different choices and there's been quite a bit of research into what the best fluid is for initial resuscitation, isotonic crystalloids still appear to be as effective as any other initially, um, and the, the cost is less than those of the other fluids. Perhaps what's even more important than the type of fluid that's used is actually uh, how much of the fluids we give. And this is kind of using, looking at all of the various studies I just showed you, um, the Process Arise Promise study as well as River study here on the lower left. And when all of these were looked at together, what was actually discovered is that the mortality rate was directly correlated with the total amount of fluids that were given in each of these studies in the first 72 hours. And in a nutshell, what has been discovered over the past 15 years of research is that judicious fluid therapy is more likely to improve survival as opposed to aggressive fluid therapy. So we want to just titrate to effect. In dogs, that probably means no more than about 10, 20 mils per kilo per bolus. And in cats, probably more like 5 to 10 mils per kilo per bolus, rather than the traditional shock volumes, which were approximately one blood volume of 80 to 90 mils per kilo in a dog or 40 to 60 mils per kilo in a cat. And we want to try and titrate our bolus therapy as rapidly as possible in the first six hours if we can, to normalize the cardiovascular and perfusion parameters rather than stretching it out over 24, 48 hours. Looking overall at fluid therapy, the key point here is be cautious. Titrate to effect and give more fluids early on. We don't want to give excessive fluid therapy because we know that that's associated with increased mortality rates and that we no longer will give 80 mils per kilo to a dog that's in shock all at once. We know now that the revised starling forces that take into account the importance of the endothelial glycocalyx as an actual um, compartment, so there's fluid actually just below the endothelial glycocalyx that probably counteracts the effects of oncotic pressure changes in the bloodstream more than the ratio of intravascular to interstitial oncotic pressure. So this basically means that the use of synthetic colloids for the purpose we've traditionally used them for is, is not necessarily physiologically sound. So again, supporting the use of isotonic crystalloids as the initial fluid of choice based on the fact that intravascular volume is dependent not only on hydrostatic pressure but also on the ratio of oncotic pressure inside the vessel compared to the subendothelial glycocalyx space. The use of synthetic colloids has also been associated with increased risk for acute kidney injury in people and possibly animals, although I think further research is, is ongoing and necessary. The use of hypertonic saline is one that has been quite interesting over the years. And I do think it's a, a fluid that, especially for larger dogs or those with head trauma, is, is quite attractive. It, it not only helps to pull fluid into the vascular space, but can also help to increase cardiac contractility, decrease endothelial swelling, uh, and potentially even immunomodulate in patients like those with sepsis and SIRS that might have dysfunction of uh, the pro and anti-inflammatory response systems. So what if fluids can't get our perfusion parameters to where we want them to be based on what we talked about our goals are? Well, we may need to look at vasopressor and or inotropic support. And this is going to primarily be either dopamine or norepinephrine as our first line treatment. In humans, they have stopped using dopamine for treatment of SIRS and sepsis, primarily due to an increased risk of arrhythmias. Some studies have also shown in increased mortality. I, I don't know that we have this information available in veterinary medicine, so I think either drug at this point in time is acceptable. Phenylephrine is a pure vasoconstrictor drug and is less commonly used in these patients. Epinephrine at a lower dose that's titrated may be a drug that's used more commonly in the future. 
um, not necessarily CPR doses, but just enough to get a balanced alpha and beta adrenergic response. And then for animals that are refractory to catecholamines and or very acidemic, vasopressin may be another option. Unfortunately, the cost of vasopressin has gone up in recent years, so its use has subsequently declined, but it might be useful as a second-line agent in animals with a catecholamine refractory hypotension. And then for animals that might have cardio, um, I'm sorry, cardiac contractility dysfunction, so decreases in inotropy, the use of a positive inotrope such as dobutamine might be indicated as long as the patient is monitored closely for subsequent arrhythmias that may occur. So what should our goal blood pressure be? We mentioned 65 for a mean or maybe 90 for a Doppler. And I just wanted to show a bit of evidence from small animals to support this. This was a study done in, in cats um, in our ICU actually at Penn where we looked at 83 cats in the intensive care unit um, that had one or more Doppler reading less than 90 while in the ICU. And we found that they had a decrease in survival of about 64% uh, versus 32% mortality in patients that had a blood pressure greater than 90 during their entire stay. If the Doppler blood pressure was increased with our therapy by 20 or more millimeters of mercury, then they were also more likely to survive to discharge Again, showing that we want to really try and maximize the parameters that we can measure, like blood pressure in these animals, to, to increase their survival rates. So in dogs, we also found that in dogs presenting to the emergency room with a blood pressure less than 90 that were treated with intravenous fluids, a large majority of them actually did respond to fluid therapy. So 23 out of 35 had normalization of their blood pressure those that did not respond were more likely to be euthanized than those that did respond and had normalization of their parameters. So again, using our blood pressure targets and, and using fluid therapy and maybe vasopressor therapy to achieve those targets is evidence-based at this point in time. So what about oxygen therapy? Well, it's indicated for animals that have a pulse ox less than 95%, a PAO2 less than 80%, perhaps even a hematocrit less than 25% acutely that are pending getting blood transfusion or suspected hypoxemia, even if a number cannot be obtained in, in a given animal. Again, I'm going to mention the central venous oxygen saturation less than 70%, which we'll talk a little bit more about just so everyone's aware of what this means. But for now, suffice to say that we will consider giving oxygen therapy to patients that meet these criteria. We can use an oxygen cage that's temperature and humidity controlled, potentially a mask, flow by, or even a hood. Um, I did want to mention that recently the use of, of high flow oxygen therapy, which is what the picture on the lower right is, has become more popular as a tool to help animals with apparent dyspnea and severe hypoxemia that may otherwise require mechanical ventilation to normalize their oxygen saturation and partial pressure of oxygen. This is a high, high oxygen flow therapy that's administered through nasal prongs or cannula and is temperature and humidity controlled so that we can get more comfortable high flows. The risks of oxygen therapy, at least in the initial stages of treatment, are, are not anything to worry about. But with more than 12 to 24 hours of oxygen therapy, we do want to try and keep the FiO2 less than 60%. And we also want to keep the PaO2 in a normal range, not a super normal range, to decrease the risk of oxygen toxicity. So I've mentioned venous oxygen saturation a couple of times now. What exactly is this? Well, it's, it's an attempt to detect abnormalities between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption in the oxygen delivery dependent phase of the oxygen delivery curve. So we found that animals with normal physical exam parameters can still have low venous oxygen saturation. It's been shown to be a valuable predictor of survival and failure to increase the saturation of the venous blood within six hours of presentation has been shown to have about a 14% increase in mortality in people. And again, it's telling us 
What is the oxygen supply to demand balance? If it's low, we should attempt to increase delivery because there's probably not enough oxygen delivered to the tissues to meet the demand. So this is a, a little uh, figure showing kind of what would cause potential decreases in oxygen saturation of the venous system and what might actually cause it to appear increased. Let's look at some of the evidence out. Um, first in 2011, uh, Dr. Hayes et al. looked at 126 dogs with a central venous catheter and, and a mortality risk in the ICU of about 31%. They measured the central venous oxygen saturation and found that if it was less than 68%, that was associated with an increase in mortality. And every 10% drop under 68% meant the odds of a poor outcome increased by 2.66 times. Other factors that predicted a low central venous oxygen saturation were PCV, mean arterial pressure, a fever, or a low pulse oximetry reading. One other study that uh, was, was done by Conti Patara et al. Um, looked at changes in tissue perfusion parameters in dogs with severe sepsis and septic shock, secondary to pyometra, in response to goal-directed hemodynamic optimization at admission to ICU, and looked at the relationship to outcome. And what they found was that using kind of a goal-directed therapy, monitoring central venous oxygen saturation as well as lactate and base deficit in dogs that had come out of surgery for uh, pyometra and septic shock, they found that that was predictive of the outcome. And if the SCVO2 was 75%, the chance for survival was increased versus 62% was the average in those that, that subsequently died. So using... Uh, machines to even just measure lactate, like you see in the top right, which is easy to do. Nova has a, a lactate meter that has been validated. Um, it can be useful for monitoring and prognosticating in these patients. So next I wanted to talk about antimicrobial therapy. I think it's well known now that early antimicrobial therapy is recommended. Uh, waiting can definitely increase mortality. And so I wanted to just go through a few different possibilities for empiric antimicrobial therapy in patients that are suspected to have bacterial sepsis. And these are either single or combination agents that show four quadrant coverage. Obviously, it also depends on the, the bugs themselves that we suspect are present the tissues and penetration to those tissues and immunocompetency of the host. But for severely affected patients, um, one of these combinations or single agents is, is often recommended. And obviously, if there's some sort of nidus for that infection, then it should be addressed with surgical treatment, debridement, uh, lavage, as indicated pending the situation. So early antimicrobial therapy for every hour of delay. In people, they found that there's an increased mortality of anywhere from about 75 to 13%. We also know that if the wrong antibiotic is chosen initially, there's a five-fold increase in mortality. Again, another reason to use those four-quadrant bactericidal, usually intravenous medications. Septic dogs that were prescribed the correct antibiotics um, were found to occur about 53% of the time in a study by Dickinson. And although looking at the numbers, there might have been a relationship to outcome if the correct antibiotic was chosen, um, it did not reach statistical significance. I think the moral of the story is you don't want to delay starting therapy to obtain cultures, but you do want to try and get your cultures um, as soon as possible. and, and definitely within administration of the first dose of antibiotics if you can. We want to choose bactericidal intravenous antibiotics that target the suspected or organism in the site of, of infection. And once we get our culture and susceptibility testing returned, we want to make sure to de-escalate our antimicrobial therapy in an attempt to decrease the risk for antimicrobial resistance. So what about nutrition? This is an important part of treatment that I feel like sometimes is overlooked. 
Um, we want to try and use enteral nutrition in these patients as soon as possible if we can, either by nasoesophageal tube or nasogastric tube, possibly esophagostomy tube if they're already under anesthesia or potentially a gastrostomy or jejunostomy tube, depending on what the underlying disease is. We know that the enteral route is preferred to provide nutrition to the enterocytes, but only if the patient is able to tolerate it without vomiting, regurgitation, and of course, if they are uh, sternal uh, for their feedings and have a, a gag reflex present to protect their airway in the event of vomiting or regurgitation. In addition, we can consider parenteral therapy if enteral therapy is contraindicated using either a central or peripheral catheter to deliver either total or partial parenteral nutrition, depending on what type of catheter we're able to place in the patient. Uh, obviously, total parenteral nutrition would be desirable until enteral nutrition is achieved, uh, but even partial and parenteral nutrition is, is better than nothing. So usually we're going to calculate the resting energy rate and we'll deliver that um, in incremental doses of maybe 50% of RER on day one and then either full or 75% on day two, uh, depending on how the animal is tolerating the, the nutrition. We generally do want to monitor them closely for any evidence of refeeding, uh, nausea, or uh, potentially changes in things like electrolytes, lipemia if they're getting parenteral nutrition, uh, hyperglycemia, or other potential complications of parenteral or enteral nutrition. In addition, we might want to consider gastrointestinal protectant therapy. Many of these patients have, have some sort of gastrointestinal ulcers due to either hypoperfusion, increases in acidity, decreases in mucosal defense mechanisms, or possibly drugs such as steroids or disease processes like renal failure, hepatic failure, and even just prolonged anorexia. If the patient is receiving any ileus-inducing drugs such as opioids or has primary ileus, prokinetics uh, such as metoclopramide might be indicated. We also sometimes consider protective agents like sucralfate if the patient is able to tolerate enteral sucralfate without vomiting. And then antiemetics for those patients that are nauseated, either uh, meropotent or potentially on dancitron or dilacitron, as well as phenothiazines if they're cardiovascularly stable. This is one study that was done at Penn looking at the use of early nutritional support in dogs with septic peritonitis. And in these 45 dogs, it was found that those that received consistent caloric support, regardless of the route, within 24 hours of surgery, had 1.6 days less of hospitalization compared to those that don't. So for multiple reasons, we want to try and encourage uh, quick uh, feeding of these patients to help with their immune system, help with their recovery uh, and overall well-being of their GI tract. So how about some additional interventions that are considered in patients with SIRS or sepsis? Well, what about glucose control? Um, point of care analyzers to monitor blood glucose are so easily available and affordable now uh, that we know we're going to monitor things like blood glucose frequently. There were some earlier studies around 2003 showing that intensive insulin therapy in ICU patients might be beneficial. And this was, again, one of the earlier studies where they gave insulin to maintain euglycemia and found decreased mortality, uh, decreased bacteremia, and less inflammation in these patients. However, subsequent studies found that intensive glucose control may not be benign. And this study here, the NICE sugar study in 2009, looked at over 6,000 ICU patients that were randomized to either strict or conventional glucose control. And in people, um, traditional is 180 to 200 uh, milligrams per deciliter compared to strict regulation, which is keeping the blood sugar around 80 to 110 uh, millimoles per, per liter. So what they found is that in, in patients that had intensive control of glucose, they were more likely to develop hypoglycemia with a blood glucose less than 40. 
And they did not see any difference in median ICU stay, hospital stay, days of mechanical ventilation, or need for renal replacement therapy. And actually, the patients in the intensive blood glucose control group had a higher mortality. So we no longer recommend really aggressive glucose control, but we do want to monitor the glucose frequently and try to keep the glucose in veterinary patients probably less than about 250, uh, max of 300, because we do know that chronic hyperglycemia is going to have deleterious inflammatory effects as well as potentially make a good uh, reservoir for infection production. So additional inter interventions besides glucose control, well, I'm sure many of you have considered the use of physiologic steroid therapy, especially in some of the really sick patients with severe inflammation. There's a syndrome that is now recognized as CIRCI, which stands for Critical Illness-Related Corticosteroid Insufficiency. And we know that the steroids are a necessary part of physiologic function to maintain immunocompetence, adrenergic responsiveness, vascular tone and pressure, as well as cardiac contractility and coronary blood flow. And there was one study that showed not only that um, a baseline cortisol might be important, but more, probably more significantly is that we needed to do a, an ACTH stimulation to determine whether or not this CIRCI might be present. And this study looked at 33 septic dogs that had an ACTH stimulation test and were critically ill. And they found that if the change in cortisol was less than three mics per deciliter, that that was predictive of hypotension, survival to discharge, and 28-day survival. And for patients that had a change in cortisol greater than three with an ACTH stim test, the rate of death was 4.1 times less than those that had a change in cortisol of, of less than three. So physiologic doses of steroids may be indicated in these patients that have either exhaustion of their adrenals or decreases in, in the ability to mount a response to stress and ACTH that can often lead to refractory hypotension despite the increases in catecholamines endogenously, as well as potentially vasopressor administration. The 2016 Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines in Human Medicine said to give steroids to patients with vasopressor refractory septic shock, it seems to promote a more rapid shock reversal, although there may be no change in mortality, but patients went from um, either 13 to 4 days of shock or 7 to 3 days of shock when supplemented with physiologic doses of steroids in human studies. They recommend not basing the decision on an ACTH stim only because uh, this prolongs or delays treatment um, and it may not be available for immediate testing. And, of course, when you feel as though the steroids are no longer necessary, it is important to wean them slowly. The um, drug of choice for people and for animals is hydrocortisone, which can be given at 0.5 mg per kg IVQ six hours or potentially split up as a CRI. Um, or sometimes, if that's not available, we will give dexamethasone sodium phosphate at a dose of 0.01 to 0.02 mg per kg Q24 hours IV, which again is just a physiologic dose. It's, it's, it's not meant to suppress the immune system or interfere with the inflammatory response, but more just to help the patient's physiologic reserve to maintain normal tension and cardiac function. So how are we going to monitor the patient with SIRS or sepsis? Well, we want to start by um, making sure that we do frequent physical exams. Um, the physical examination is probably the most important tool that a veterinarian has, and really paying close attention to the perfusion parameters, like um, the warmth of the extremities and the pulse quality, the mucous membrane color and the capillary refill time, the level of mentation and how the patient appears to feel when you look at them, as well as the, the more objective parameters like heart rate and respiratory rate and blood pressure and lactate. But starting with just the physical examination parameters and repeating those as often as possible is, is of utmost importance. 
We also want to make sure to monitor body weight so that our patients are not increasing or decreasing uh, without our awareness. Blood glucose, as we mentioned, as well as a packed cell volume and total solids measurement, um, usually in critically ill patients every four hours, if not more often. Venous or arterial blood gas to look at pH, uh, acid base balance, as well as electrolytes and possibly even lactate if it's on there. If not, using a point of care lactate machine is, again, very easy to do. And then in select uh, practices or, or institutions, maybe even monitoring colloid osmotic pressure in patients with hypoproteinemia. Additional monitoring that we want to do is keeping a close eye on our complete blood count or at least a blood smear, a biochemical profile and coagulation profile, since we know many of these patients develop coagulation abnormalities. We want to do point of care testing that not only will include blood glucose, lactate, but maybe even newer blood uh, point of care machines such as creatinine, ketones, and, and others that will be available and validated hopefully in the near future. Electrocardiographic monitoring as well as blood pressure, central venous pressure, and central venous oxygen saturation if you feel they're indicated may be helpful in assessing the patient and the response to therapy. Pulse oximetry reading for oxygenation. Urine output is important to make sure that the, the patient is not becoming oliguric or anuric and also monitoring that urine for any evidence of cast, glucose, uh, or signs of infection. And keeping a close eye on vomiting or nausea or any other abnormalities that um, should be addressed therapeutically or may increase the risk for something like aspiration pneumonia. Potential complications that we really want to be aware of when we're monitoring these patients, one is disseminated intravascular coagulation, looking at things like blood smears for cystocytes, monitoring our coagulation profile, our platelet count, our D-dimers, as well as the patient clinically for any evidence of fatigue or other signs of bleeding is, is important. Cardiac insufficiency, perhaps doing a TFAS to look at cardiac contractility, left atrial to aortic size to help manage the patient's overall intravascular volume and cardiac function. Acute lung injury or acute respiratory distress syndrome. This can be seen in any animal with underlying inflammation or diseases that may lead to leakiness of the vascular endothelium and subsequently cause a non-cardiogenic high-protein edema within the lungs. Acute kidney injury, as evidenced by even mild increases in creatinine and or decreases in urine output that we want to identify and address as soon as possible. Gastrointestinal and hepatic dysfunction, so primarily monitoring signs of, of nausea, monitoring for diarrhea. Um, thinking about the fact that bacterial translocation could lead to uh, further infections in the animals and, and inflammation, and then monitoring for hepatic dysfunction, which might be recognized by uh, decreases in albumin production as well as a decrease in coagulation factor production. And then microcirculatory dysfunction, which is beyond the scope of, of this discussion, but is uh, an interest of mine. We do know that animals with severe uh, sepsis and, and even inflammatory diseases can get inappropriate shunting of blood out of microcirculatory beds that are in need of oxygen and nutrients and a decrease in the total number of microvascular uh, beds that are available for oxygen delivery to the tissues. And this can be very heterogeneous in nature and something that will be studied a bit more in the future. Well, I want to go to a case now because I feel like we can talk about a lot of these therapies and monitoring, but really applying it to a case sometimes helps it to, to stick and hit home as to the importance of the things that we have discussed so, such far, so far this hour. So Pat, if you remember, is a six-year-old male castrated Rhodesian Ridgeback that we, we talked briefly about in the last lecture. And Patrick has no past medical histories up to date on his vaccines has good parasite control, but got into the trash two days ago after the owners had a party at their house and then started vomiting thereafter and became anorexic. The owners haven't noticed any change in his drinking urination and he's had no bowel movement since this started. 
And on your physical examination, you note that Patrick is quite depressed ment mentally. He is responsive, uh, seems about 6 to 8% dehydrated based on his mucous membrane dryness and skin turgor. His mucous membranes are bright red with a rapid capillary refill time of 0.5 seconds. His rectal temperature is 103 degrees Fahrenheit. His heart rate is 160 beats per minute. With synchronous bounding femoral pulses, you don't hear a murmur. His respiratory rate is 28. He has cranial abdominal pain and proceeds to vomit bile after you palpate his abdomen and then has a mucus-filled diarrhea. You're, you start to think about his problems and your initial diagnostic plan with his first problem being the vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. You have assessed this subjectively and objectively with dehydration, increased rectal temperature, and his tachycardia. And your primary rule outs are either GI or extra GI as listed here. Your diagnostics that you might consider initially would be a venous blood gas extended database, a non-invasive blood pressure, uh, a spot check of his EKG due to his tachycardia, a complete blood count, a biochemical profile, urinalysis, and probably hold some for culture and susceptibility testing, abdominal radiographs, plus or minus an ultrasound, a fecal exam, Maybe consider a canine pancreatic lipase immunoreactivity if you suspect pancreatitis. Maybe an ACTH stim if you suspect that he could be Addisonian. And possibly chest rads if there's any suspicion of uh, intrathoracic disease or if you want to rule out neoplastic metastasis. So the initial therapy would probably include intravenous fluids, maybe a, an antacid like famotidine or pantoprazole analgesia therapy, and uh, maybe consider an antiemetic and possibly antibiotics at this stage, but I don't know that either of those are definitive musts just yet. Monitoring of the vitals, your physical exam parameters, any eliminations, continued blood pressure monitoring, and his weight would be important. So let's look at the results of the initial diagnostics. Your extended data based on a venous blood gas shows a PCV of 60 with a solids of 65. I think you can appreciate that the solid seems just a touch low compared to that PCV, possibly due to either um, loss of those solids or potentially splenic contraction, um, increase of the PCV, but also uh, dehydration. The blood glucose is a bit high at 250. The pH is low at 7.19 with what appears to be respiratory compensation and hyperventilation with the PVCO2 at 28. Sodium is a little elevated as is the chloride at 154 and 128 respectively. The bicarbonate is low at 10. Creatinine is elevated at 2.9 as is the phosphorus at 10 and the lactate is increased at 4.1. So it looks like there, this is all consistent with what we initially thought on our physical exam. That lactate is very concerning. He has a primary metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation and a discordant PCD in total solids. Looks like he also has a little bit of free water loss as evidenced by the sodium and chloride elevation. His non-invasive blood pressure by Doppler is 85 millimeters of mercury, so that's low. EKG shows a sinus tachycardia with a pulse oximeter reading of 97%. Abdominal radiographs show poor serosal detail in the cranial abdomen and a gas-filled duodenum, and chest radiographs were clear. So your initial therapeutic plan based on um, these diagnostics and while you're getting these diagnostics might include an isotonic crystalloid such as plasmolite, um, in this case, he got about a third of a blood volume based on that lactate, heart rate, and other parameters. And then we could consider more if needed, but we'll probably want to stick to no more than 20 to 30 mils per kilo to start. We may want to consider a synthetic colloid if the crystalloid is not effective or if it seems to have a short-lived efficacy. And we could consider boluses of 5 mils per kilo up to a maximum of 20 mils per kilo if indicated. We want to reassess after every bolus, recheck his blood glucose after resuscitation in case part of the hyperglycemia was catecholamine driven, and maybe consider flow by oxygen therapy until we have him more stabilized. Low dose methadone was given IV for the abdominal discomfort to try and prevent him from being painful.
So his progression, after one and a half total liters of either sodium chloride or plasmolite and 300 mils of head of starch, his rectal temperature was down to 102, his heart rate was 120, his Doppler pressure came up to 115, he was actually starting to look a little brighter, his glucose was down to 150, and he had a lactate of 2.2. So things seemed to be going in the right direction. Um, but as luck would have it, about an hour later, Patrick developed severe hematemesis and hematochesia. His blood pressure fell back to down to 65, and his heart rate jumped up to 180 beats per minute. So what do you, what do you want to do now? Well, we're going to have to obviously start from scratch here, keeping in mind what we've already done, but probably repeat our resuscitation protocol to a degree. He's having a lot of losses and probably consider additional diagnostics that may have been kind of plus or minuses or further out in the tier two or three categories. So that might include a, a PT and PTT, a D-dimer, maybe a blood type and a cross match and possibly a colloid osmotic pressure if available. Maybe an abdominal ultrasound just to make sure that our RADs, uh, we didn't miss anything on our radiograph. Perhaps get a urine for culture if not done already. Repeat an extended database, including a PCD solids and lactate. See how they've changed now. Probably start GI protectants, antiemetics, and antimicrobials if we haven't done that. Consider placement of a central multi-lumen catheter once he's stabilized and make sure we have a code from the owner just in case things don't go well. So after receiving an additional bolus of saline and head of starch, the blood pressure is 90 millimeters of mercury. The PT and PTT are both prolonged and the colloid osmotic pressure is 12 normals, about 18 to 22. We give 15 mils per kilo of fresh frozen plasma over about two hours, and on ultrasound, we see severe pancreatitis and large amounts of effusion. On cytology, it appears to be a neutrophilic exudate with no evidence of sepsis. PCV is now down to 23 with a solids of 2.5, and unfortunately, our lactate is up to 5. So we do give Patrick 10 mils per kilo of packed red cells to try and keep his oxygen content in his blood adequate since his PCV is dropped now below 24. We also place the central line and his central venous pressure is around seven, which is really just a pressure, but it does tell us that right atrial pressures are probably um, very adequate and not going to accept a lot more fluid. His blood pressure is 90 millimeters of mercury. He has red mucous membranes with a CRT less than half a second still. Extremities are warm. He just feels very vasodilated and has bounding pulses. So we start dopamine at five mics per kg per minute to just help increase his vasomotor tone and hopefully improve his blood pressure and perfusion. We continue his plasmolite and head of search with intermittent fresh frozen plasma every eight hours. And his non-invasive blood pressure is now 110 millimeters of mercury. He looks more comfortable, seems to have stabilized after our little crisis situation, and uh, we are going to continue our therapy of plasmolite, head of starch, fresh frozen plasma every eight hours, dopamine at five, esomeprazole or pantoprazole, metoclopramide, ticarcillin clavulinate, and flow by oxygen. We repeat our extended database and now see if PCV has come up to an acceptable number of solids is unfortunately quite low. Glucose is elevated again, um, still a bit on the acidotic side with a, a small amount of respiratory compensation, but luckily it looks like his lactate's a little bit better and creatinine is, is holding in there. We do consider insulin therapy at this point since his glucose is 300. That's kind of sitting in, a, in an unacceptably high range. Generally, over 250, we consider insulin, and at 300, we almost always will start insulin in these patients. We also decide to place a urinary catheter to monitor his ins and outs and uh, keep a closer eye on urine output. We started total parenteral nutrition through his central line. Unfortunately, when we do that, we give them a lot of IV dextrose, so his blood glucose did increase further, and we had to reformulate the TTN to contain less dextrose and also start the insulin CRI if it hadn't been started already. His blood pressure was kind of wavering in the 90 millimeters of mercury range. His central venous pressure hung around five. 
Heart rate was at 120, and he still looked very vasodilated um, despite our dopamine therapy with a, with a rectal temperature of 102.2. We gradually increased the dopamine to 15 mics per kilo per minute, and then we started him on norepinephrine as well at 0.1 mics per kg per minute. And his non-invasive blood pressure was at 95 millimeters of mercury, which was considered acceptable, although not ideal. His abdominal effusion was quite severe. We were worried about the degree of discomfort this was causing him, as well as uh, the prevention of caudal displacement of his abdomen, of his, of his diaphragm when he was breathing. So we decided to measure his intra-abdominal pressure using his urinary catheter as our measurement device we hooked up a water manometer and a three-way stopcock, and we measured it to be 25. Um, we want that to be less than 5 to 10, so this was, this was elevated and suggests that there may be a decrease in perfusion to abdominal or organs from uh, a compartment syndrome, from the intra-abdominal pressure and the effusion. So because of that, we decided to place a pigtail catheter into the abdomen to drain out this abdominal fluid that appeared to be non-septic and inflammatory and this would make the dog more comfortable and also help with his breathing effort. This is what he looked like, all hooked up to his machines, his abdominal drain in, his urinary catheter in. Um, he's receiving parental nutrition and very close monitoring. And then on day three, we decided to go ahead and start some steroids. Um, we did actually show that his ACH stim test um, was inadequate. The units here are a little different. Uh, than what I gave before, but again, uh, a delta less than three, I had said, or in these units, 83 is indicative of CERTI. So we gave him dexamethasone at 0.02 mg per kg IV, and this was our attempt to try and stabilize him a little bit faster and get him off of those vasopressor agents. We did place an arterial catheter to monitor direct arterial blood pressure, and we continued his supportive care, matching ins and outs to try and prevent volume overload or underload. And clinically, he was depressed um, and nauseated, but, but stable for the time being. Over the course of day three to six, his blood pressure gradually improved. We were able to wean his pressure slowly when his mean blood pressure was greater than 110 for four hours. First, we decreased the dopamine, and subsequently, we were able to wean off the norepinephrine as well. By day seven, he appeared clinically improved. We went ahead and completely weaned his norepinephrine by the end of day seven, pulled his abdominal drain, which had decreased in production, pulled his urinary catheter, and then obtained a cysto sample for culture following uh, removal of the urinary catheter to make sure he didn't have a nosocomial infection. We also stopped giving him fresh frozen plasma at this point, He's 8 to 10, he started drinking water on his own and keeping it down. He was able to go on short walks outside to eliminate and even started eating small amounts of a bland diet on, on day 8. We were able to take away the insulin CRI as his glucose remained stable. We started weaning the TPN on day 9 when it appeared that he was able to eat on his own and keep everything down. And we also started weaning off some of his gastrointestinal medications. He was... He was discharged on day 10 um, to some very happy owners. Uh, granted, his bill was in excess of $10,000, but um, at least he was able to go home. Some of the future therapies that uh, are being looked at, I think, will come as we gain more research in this field, especially in veterinary medicine. Targeted individualized treatments based on specific genomic and cellular alterations are probably going to be the way of the future where we can really, using, if you can remember that pyro scheme we talked about in the first lecture, to try and look at what is actually happening, not only genetically, but real time in that patient's inflammatory system to really target our therapy most appropriately to either decrease inflammation or maybe even stimulate inflammation based on how the individual animal is responding maybe even using biomarkers more specifically to try and guide our therapy and determine where they are in the inflammatory response. And these are, these are exciting new avenues, I think, for studying SIRS and, and sepsis in, in animals and people.
So in conclusion, remember that rapid treatment of SIRS and sepsis is, is truly vital. We want to normalize oxygen delivery to the tissues as soon as possible, definitely within six hours if we can. But judicious fluid therapy, titrate to effect to prevent volume overload and decrease in mortality. We want to use repeated physical examinations, all of our hemodynamic variables and point of care testing to try and closely monitor these patients and how they're responding, responding to our treatment and supportive care. Don't forget about nutrition and the importance of nutrition in these patients. Consider physiologic steroids if they have refractory tension. And with that, I, I would like to go ahead and answer any questions that you might have. Hopefully you're not all asleep as the pug and the toddler in this picture. Uh, thank you again for participating in this webinar. I, I do hope it's been useful. And again, thank you to NOVA for providing this CE to everyone. Have a good night, and I will go ahead and entertain questions at this point. I'm, I'm looking at the list of questions right now, and I believe you have to go ahead and enter them into the system if anybody has any. Uh, maybe it was really clear and nobody has questions. Oh, there we go. We're starting to get one. Here's a question that says, have you ever used a CRI of epinephrine if other vasopressors are unavailable? And if so, what is the dose? Um, CRI of epinephrine is, is a recent... Uh, I, I recently described treatment for animals that may be catecholamine refractory or potentially uh, unavailable. Uh, and I do think that it's something to consider. At a very low dose, epinephrine can actually stimulate more beta receptors than alpha receptors. So there's an increase in both heart rate and contractility Potentially deleteriously, there can also be an increase in uh, the the work of the heart and therefore oxygen demand and and oxygen consumption of the heart. Um, the the very low dose range, uh, I am happy to provide to you. I want to make sure I give you the correct dose, and it's something we have not used very often. So I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive dose right now. But if you're able to email me. Uh, after this, I'm happy to to provide you with that dose. Uh, I don't want to say a number that might be wrong, but yes, low dose epinephrine, I, I think, does have a place in the treatment of of hypotensive vasodilated patients with SIRS or sepsis. Okay, I see another question here: uh, Is the hyperglycemia due to insulin resistance from the systemic inflammation? That, that's a great question, and there's a lot of different potential theories as to why these animals become hyperglycemic. One of the most popular theories that has been somewhat supported with testing is that very high cortisol levels are actually leading to the insulin resistance. So it's like a stress response by the body in addition to high catecholamine levels that are, are contributing to the insulin resistance more so than probably pancreatic uh, insufficiency or decreases in insulin release. Cytokines have also been shown to create an anti-insulin effect and insulin resistance. And there may actually be some downregulation of insulin receptors in, in some animal models with sepsis as well. So there, it does seem to be multifactorial. Uh, I, I do believe a lot of people have probably seen it happen before. Um, and they don't tolerate a lot of dextrose supplementation very well usually in the form of TPN. Okay, the next question I see here is, which antibiotics do you recommend? Uh, well, that's, that's a, a complicated question, I think, because uh, the general answer might be use intravenous, bactericidal, uh, broad spectrum, empiric therapy that's targeted to the bugs that you suspect as well as the, the tissues where an infection might be located. Uh, 
Um, the the combinations that I, I presented in the lecture, I think, are are all valid. You want to start with probably the the lesser of the big guns, if you can, just to save the the top shelf antibiotics for resistant bugs. But animals that present to the hospital already receiving antimicrobial therapy, either at the time of presentation or perhaps within the past two to three months, very likely do have some degree of resistance that has developed. And so in those cases, we may start reaching a little bit more for top shelf drugs. Um, and by those, I'm referring to things like third-generation cephalosporins, potentially even carbapenems like neuropenem. Um, and for just the empiric animal that's not on antibiotics, I think using ampicillin and enrofloxacin or clindamycin and enrofloxacin uh, might be good starting combinations. But again, it depends on where you think the infection might be and what bugs you suspect. Uh, so, so using all of the information to to guess at what would be the best spectrum is, is usually indicated. The next question says, I may have missed this, but if there is hypoalbuminemia present, how would you manage it? Well, we, we did mention that hypoalbuminemia quite commonly does exist in these patients, not only due to losses, uh, either that leave the body or potentially losses just from transvascular leak uh, from endothelial damage. and Hypoalbuminemia can be tough to, to treat in these patients. I think classically or traditionally, we've recommended the use of synthetic colloids in animals that are not either bleeding or severely coagulopathic or thrombocytopenic. Uh, but with the recent concern about acute kidney injury, I do understand that uh, most veterinarians are more cautious. That being said, for animals with no evidence of, of kidney compromise or any degree of injury or, or renal uh, morbidity, I do still use synthetic colloids just in moderation. Many of the human studies showing acute kidney injury are using very high doses of synthetic colloids. And in small animals, we typically will only use one mil per kilo per hour as a CRI, maybe five to 10 mils per kilo as a bolus, and try not to exceed 20 mils per kilo per day of, of synthetic hydroxyethyl starches. The tetra starches can probably be used up to even 40 mils per kilo per day. Uh, but again, there's ongoing studies. I think the biggest and uh, probably best quality study being, is being done currently, and we should have the results next year. Uh, it was through one of the, the grants that I help with, so I know about it, and, and hopefully we'll have more information about that soon. The use of canine albumin or potentially human albumin uh, is is something to entertain, and it is a treatment that we use quite often in the ICU where I work. Um, but it, you have to remember that this is really for animals that have an albumin less than about one to one and a half and have continued ongoing losses. And if you're going to use human albumin, you want to make sure that the patient is also immunosuppressed to some degree because it does elicit quite an antigenic response. And uh, we don't want animals to have either some type of immediate sensitivity or potentially a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, which is quite common with a human product. The canine product has a little less research behind it, primarily because it has been intermittently available uh, due to production problems. And uh, it, it is extremely expensive, actually much, much more expensive than the human product. But there, is, uh, there are some new manufacturing uh, places that may lower the price a little bit in the future, and hopefully within the next year or so, there will be another company making canine albumin, and, and that might help us as well with cost. So I think either canine albumin or potentially synthetic colloids are probably the best way to deal with this. I mentioned the dose for synthetic colloids. With albumin, we usually use one to two grams per kilo. Um, it's generally given as a CRI after perhaps a small initial bolus over 10 or more hours. So it, it's, it's a very potent colloid. Uh, it's, it's a decent volume, so we don't want to cause volume overload with these products. It's, it's one of the big concerns we have when administering it. I'm happy to talk more, give more information by email, uh, because there, there is a lot of information to go over with synthetic colloids or albumin. There's also been a more recent paper showing that the use of cryopore plasma uh, 
or potentially even frozen plasma can provide a good source of albumin in dogs that don't necessarily need coagulation factors. Obviously, the volume of these products is quite large, so they have to be fluid tolerant. Um, generally, we, we guess that about 40 to 45 mils per kilo of plasma is necessary to raise the albumin between half and one gram per deciliter. So again, that can be quite expensive, but it, it may be a practical way to increase albumin safely in animals that uh, are hypoalbuminemic, especially very small animals. This can be not too cost prohibitive. If they have a coagulopathy and hypoalbuminemia, obviously fresh frozen plasma might be indicated, but again, plasma by itself is not a very efficient way to increase oncotic pressure or albumin, but it can be used in select circumstances. So the, the next question is, do you ever use CRI antibiotics in your septic patients? This is a great question, and there's now good evidence, at least in dogs, to support the fact that a CRI of the time-dependent antibiotic is probably superior to intermittent dosing. And it's really just a matter of getting the therapeutic level in the bloodstream maintained throughout a 24-hour period, so there's not a chance for the bugs to, to replicate. Um, and both human and, and veterinary evidence are, are in strong support of doing this. I think sometimes it can be as much of a management problem as anything, especially if we're using antibiotics that don't play nicely with other drugs, such as uh, Zosin, Piperzillin, and Tazobactam, which is a commonly used antibiotic as a, as a CRI. But for, for especially penicillins, most likely even cephalosporins, um, and others, it, it has been shown that CRIs may be superior. I think more evidence will be available in the future that might help guide us. But for now, there has been some good studies on penicillins, primarily extended spectrum penicillins in small animals with sepsis. So great, that's, that's a great question. The next question is, uh, with our septic patients, we often see issues with thermoregulation. Usually they end up too low. We give warm IV fluids and provide warm bedding, et cetera. Are there absolute temperatures we should be trying to achieve? For instance, post-op pyometra almost always have around 98, but clinically are doing well. Well, that, that's also a, a, an interesting question. I think we do want to try and keep them as close to normal as possible. In some animals that are azotemic, it's important to remember that their set point tends to be lower than normal animals without azotemia. So they typically do want to hover around 98, 99 degrees, and they will be still hot if we try to warm them much above that. Uh, but for animals suffering with sepsis that are hypothermic, I do think continuing with uh, aggressive warming is important. We obviously don't want to make them uh, their temperature go above normal, but I think 98 is probably a little too low if they're not azotemic. Um, and, and probably somewhere between 99 and 100 would be ideal. Um, if we increase the temperature too much, that can obviously cause increases in oxygen consumption in an attempt to get rid of heat, things like shivering. Um, so probably trying to just keep it in the normal range is best. And I, I do realize that can be difficult sometimes. I think circulating warm air around them with some sort of blanket or comforter over the warm air that's circulating um, is often the most successful in addition to using uh, the warm IV fluid. Thank you for that question. Uh, the next question I have is, in the practice where I work, we use component therapy and plasma is preferred to synthetic colloids. Would you choose plasma over synthetic colloid if readily available? And this includes cryopore. Um, I touched upon that just a little bit, and I think that you have to weigh the pros and cons of both. Um, obviously, with synthetic colloids, we worry about uh, coagulation as well as the potential for acute kidney injury, but I consider that to be not common and not fully proven at this point. But if an animal is azotemic or has any evidence of acute kidney injury, which may be as simple as a very mild elevation in creatinine within the normal range, so maybe they come in at 0.4 and they increase to 0.7, to me that indicates a potential problem, assuming they're not volume deplete. So if there's any risk of using synthetic colloids, I will de definitely re reach for either um, a natural colloid uh, in the form of plasma or potentially 
uh, albumin, concentrated albumin. But again, the, the oncotic pressure of something like albumin is, is going to be close to 20, which is the normal dog. So if we're talking about trying to really increase oncotic pressure, then a synthetic colloid or concentrated albumin would be far more effective with smaller volumes and less cost. If our, our goal is to increase the albumin, then obviously giving concentrated albumin or potentially a synthetic colloid uh, would be indicated. It just takes a lot, I'm sorry, or plasma would be indicated but it does take a lot of blood products to get the albumin up. Uh, and so cost aside, the other consideration is that many of these animals are hypercoagulable. And when we give plasma products, even cryopore or, or frozen plasma that's more than a year old, those products still do have some of the non-labile clotting factors. And we may increase clotting factors in these patients or potentially fuel the fire of intravascular coagulation uh, such that we contribute to uh, DIC and inappropriate thrombosis in the vascular system. So I think um, it's not necessarily a reason to not use it unless you already have proof of, of intravascular coagulation and a hypercoagulable state, which in and of itself can be difficult to diagnose. But I think the cost factor, the volume, and using what are sometimes precious resources should be taken into account when comparing plasma to maybe concentrated albumin. So if money's not an issue, I would consider canine albumin if it's available for just increasing oncotic pressure and albumin as opposed to using uh, up the, the plasma supply. If the patient is coagulopathic, then I think it makes sense to just give large volumes, volumes of albumin. Uh, rather than concentrated albumin so that you can treat the albumin as well as treating the, the clotting deficiencies. Uh, so I think it depends a lot on the patient, the resources, the finances, uh, as well as coexisting abnormalities such as coagulation abnormalities. Uh, I'm looking for other questions at this point, if anybody has, and those are all great questions. I, I appreciate it. I, I don't see any right now. If, if any of you want to ask more detail about the ones you've already asked, I'm happy to answer them. I didn't mean to rush through them, but we do have a, a few more minutes here. Okay, I, I see uh, a couple people saying thank you. So I, I'd like to say you're you're very welcome, and it, it's my pleasure. I'm always happy to talk about subjects that are near and dear to my heart. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, please contact either the Nova representatives or or you can email me. I believe my email information was on the first slide uh, for the presentation. So thank you all, and and I hope you have a good night, and and that your septic patients perhaps benefit from your any knowledge you might have gained during the past hour. Thanks so much and, and take care.